If, I, if I'm gonna create a new path for myself, I have to be focused on that and that only. And I'm getting information from the horse mouth. I'm getting information from these guys. Hey, what's up everybody? And welcome to another episode of the Accolades Conversation Series in which I talk to some of my favorite artists about who or what they would recommend me checking out. Make sure to subscribe to our channel or hit the like button. Jay Mumford, better known by his stage name J-Zone, is an American record producer, drummer, multi-instrumentalist, and writer from New York City. Known for his quirky lyrics and trash talk style of rapping, J-Zone released a string of critically acclaimed albums in the late 1990s and early 2000s that acquired a cult following. J-Zone eventually walked away from rap and in 2011 published the book Root for the Villain, Rap, Bullshit, and a Celebration of Failure. Since then, he has been focused on being a multi-instrumentalist and drummer, landed a spot playing drums on the new tunes from the 1970s funk band Manzel, his band The Do Rights with Tom Tom Club guitarist Pablo Martin, and personal drum break kits for Danger Mouse and others. I spoke to Jay about Cool and the Gang, an American R&B soul funk band formed in Jersey City, New Jersey by brothers Robert Cool Bell and Ronald Bell, with Dennis Thomas, Robert Mickens, Charles Smith, George Brown, and Ricky West. They have undergone numerous changes in personnel and have explored numerous musical styles throughout their history, including jazz, rhythm and blues, soul, funk, disco, rock, and pop music. Their most successful albums of their period includes Ladies Night, Celebration, and Emergency, their highest selling album with two million copies sold in the US. If you're into my illustrations, please check out my illustration book, Accolades, which you can still get on CrateRecords.be. This is what Jay had to add. Cool in the Gang uh, has always been my favorite group for as long as I can remember, maybe since I was 11 or 12. I had a lot of different musical phases throughout my life. I began as a bass player when I was in grade eight school, and I noticed that a lot of their records were really fun to play to bass because cool Robert Cool Bell, the bass player, he started a lot of his stuff with the open E string. So it was kind of easy to get a groove going. And I learned how to play bass, you know, through those records. And then um, I got into production. So obviously everybody would sample Cool in the Gang, you know, later as a teenager and my, you know, when I was producing. Uh, and then also I was a DJ. So when you DJ, you get their old stuff on 45s has a lot of drum breaks. So you double up two copies. I, I spent a lot of time doing that. And probably about 10 years ago, I, well, maybe more like 15 years ago, I quit music entirely and just went and got a regular job. And um, then I wrote a book kind of about my experience in, in music and in hip hop. But I wanted to get back to music, but I just had no interest in being a hip hop artist or a producer at all. And I kind of discovered the drums by accident. And um, I started playing drums when I was 34 years old. And I just did it as a hobby to, to return to music. I was going to pick up the bass because that was my original thing. But I said, let me try something different because I was listening to a lot of stuff. And then when I got into drumming, naturally, the Cool of the Gang stuff was the first records that I would play along to, along with James Brown and all that other stuff. But the drummer uh, was George Brown. He's probably the second most sampled drummer of all time after after Clyde Stubblefield. So that influenced the way that I played drums. And I got really deep into that while I was learning, playing to Cool the Gang stuff. So maybe about four years into playing, I, I started a, 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 a interview column slash radio program called Give the Drummer Some with Red Bull Music Academy. And, I wanted to go around and interview all the unsung greats of jazz and funk drumming that inspired me while they were still alive because there was just a lot of the drumming media stuff is centered around like the greats like Buddy Rich and you know like the all time jazz drummers or it's focused around modern drumming like Modern Drummer Magazine and I'm like there's this whole thing of these guys where you don't know them by name but they made an impact years ago, and now with all the sampling, their their mute, their drumming lives on decades later, and you don't know who the hell they are because they weren't big jazz or rock drummers, and they're they're not part of the modern scene. So I wanted to give credit, and my first interview was with George Brown from Cool in the Gang. So I hunted him down 
and interviewed him. And the interview went so well because I knew so much about the band. He said, you know more than I do. <laughs> you know, we stayed in touch and it, he would give me tips on drumming and stuff. And uh, one time, you know, we hung out in New York and he took an Uber to the city and I had to go to the city. So I got in the Uber with him and I'm playing him all my, my folk band stuff and, and different beats and things. And he gave me, he was my number one influence as a drummer, but he gave me the most important advice of my entire career in that ride. And he said, you know, you're doing really good things with the drums. You know, I can't believe you've been playing such amount of time. You know, you sound great, but I'm going to tell you, if you want to have longevity off music, you got to learn how to write songs. He said, because your publishing, your ASCAP, your BMI, that's what's going to make sure that comes until you die and then you pass it on to whoever. So, and he's right because so many great musicians have been sampled, but they didn't write the songs that they played on. So a lot of musicians died broke because they had no publishing. They didn't write any songs. And when he told me that, I was right in the beginning of starting my band, The Do-Rights, with Pablo Martin. And I was doing a lot of drum break records and getting them licensed for television because there's no samples. So like prior to that, like with my hip hop stuff, I never made a dime in publishing because of all the samples. They couldn't use it on TV because you might get sued. Mm -hmm. So I never knew what it was like to get money from ASCAP and BMI. I just said, oh, whatever, it's public. I was more concerned with record sales and show once I took his advice and really started to pitch our do right stuff to, you know, for publishing, and I, I started submitting my drum break stuff for TV so people can talk over it, I started getting checks from ASCAP January, February, then April, May, then, you know, July, August. Like, I'm getting these checks and I'm starting to make money for stuff. I'm like, wow, this got used on it. And this whole thing opened up, and I'm like, that's what he meant. And you look at them, they made these big records like Celebration and Ladies Night, Hollywood Swingin' and Jungle Boogie. Those records are being constantly played, used, licensed, put in movies. That's money that's going to just keep rolling in. You don't have to do any shows. <laughs> you don't have to do any gigs. That's called, it's called mailbox money. It just comes on these months, this many times a year. I figured that out on the early side of me being a drummer. So when I started doing the break records, I started telling producers, they'd be like, yo, I sample your drums. I'm like, don't worry about paying me. Just put me on the publishing. So if your record blows up, I, I'm set for life. I'm written into the publishing. So I started doing that and it led to more stability as a musician. And when George told me that, it changed my life. Is that your full-time job nowadays? Yeah, I'm just a full-time drummer and composer. And now, like, my favorite thing is playing drums live. I love to play with my band. I love to release our own music, but I can do it without the pressure of like getting rich. Like I toured behind a soul singer in 2019 and I got my experience as a drummer. I got my, I got to tour as a drummer, which is, I never thought I'd ever tour again because I hated touring so much in my hip hop days. I swore I would never do that again. And then I did it and it was not lucrative. I didn't make a lot of money. But I enjoyed it for what it was because I knew the publishing was coming. So if I come off tour and I'm not rich, that's okay. Do you get recognized for being like the rapper when you go on tour still or not at all? In the beginning, here and sometimes here and there, people might recognize, but there wasn't that much overlap between the two worlds. I mean, a couple of times. I got noticed, but it's like a second. It's like a second life that you started in some way. Like yeah, like to me, I appreciate it, but then it's like I, I don't. It's a distraction because I don't want to take. I don't want to distract the attention from the artist. Like oh, that's him. He rapped twenty five years ago. Like I don't want to take the distraction away from the rest of the band. You had a, you had a solid you had a solid rap career early early two thousands. I remember what made you quit rapping in the first place? Because I never liked it in the first place. <laughs> okay, gotcha. <laughs> I wanted to be a producer. Mm -hmm. That was my passion. And the biggest lesson of my entire career, besides what George taught me, being a jack of too many trades ultimately is not a good thing because you never really master anything. And what you wind up doing is doing five different things to bring attention to what it is you want to do 
instead of just doing what it is you want to do. So in the beginning, I wanted to be a producer and make beats, but I didn't know anybody to play beats to. So I had to start releasing records with me rapping on them to draw attention to the beats. But in the process, I created a rap career that I did not want. Okay. And it took on a life of its own. And I kept trying to be a producer, but I was, you know, I was on Fat Beats the label and, you know, they would say, well, people want demand for you as an artist and this. And I just did it because it's a job. How many people get up and go to their job, but they don't really like their job. You don't normally think about that with music, but the rap thing became my job and this character, this persona, I just got tired. And then, you know, I'm trying to bring attention to the beats, but now I created the rap thing. And it's like, now I got it. So I wound up hating it. I used to do shows and want to jump off a bridge. And it got real bad to the point I hated my own music. I still can't listen to any of that. I don't have it. I don't own it. I don't listen to it. I don't talk about it. Nope. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it eventually imploded. Did that, did, that, did that change now with, like, whatever you're doing now? Oh, I love now. I, I love what I'm doing now. Yeah. Okay. I love playing drums. I don't even care what kind of music it is. I play in a rock band. I have a funk band. I, well, as I'm playing drums and I love composing, I love writing songs. I, and that's what I do now. I'll always write. I'll always be a writer on the side. But, you know, I quit rapping. I quit making beats and I quit DJing because it was taking. I was trying to use those as a vehicle for the drumming. And then people will always notice that first because I had a history doing it. So I'm like, if I really want to establish myself as a drummer and a musician in my band, then I have to do that only and cut everything. And I think meeting the guys from Cool in the Gang around that time, and I'm going to get to Ronald Bell because he played a big part in that. I came to that conclusion in my head right as I was meeting Cool in the Gang. And then you sit down. I sat down with Ronald Bell because I had been working with Cool. I got actually got a, you know, I was starting to work with their management on a cartoon series that they were working on and doing interview stuff because they knew that I was a writer and they knew I had knowledge and I, I knew a lot about the band. And I started kind of be, I was backstage at a couple of shows, I actually went to Ronald Bell's house in New Jersey and I almost passed out because this is my hero from like 30 years and I'm in his backyard and he's made me some barbecue chicken wings. I don't even eat chicken and I ate about 30 wings because I'm sitting there next to <laughs> the great Ronald Bell. And like I had already, you know, had a little bit of a rapport with George. So like I met my favorite drawing and George kind of brought me, you know, he, he gave me a pass to backstage to a show and I met Ronald and everything. And when I'm talking to Ronald Bell about their beginnings, like these years and, and starting, and I just listened to this focus and dedication they had. One focus only to be a great band, great musician. They they weren't doing a whole bunch of other things. It was just, there was this laser focus on being great. And I realized that for my whole career, I was doing whatever paid the bill, whatever stuck, do it. And just, they want me to, D, okay, DJ gig, write a column for this magazine, rap, do a beat for this guy, go do a show, like, and my heart wasn't in most of it, but it's like, oh, if they're gonna pay me to be Jay's own and do this bullshit, then I'm just gonna go do it. And I'm realizing the difference between me and the guys where I'm trying to be. Being around him just for that small period of time, that he said something to me that always stuck out. He just said, hey man, we're in the fourth quarter, talking about age, like the band had been around 50 years. And I'm like, yeah, I guess I'm in the third quarter because I'm the next generation down. If like, if I'm in the third quarter, I can't fuck around, man. Like, this is the time to do it. And this is right as I transition out of hip hop into the do rights and being a touring drummer and a session drummer. Like I'm just fresh into it and the hip hop thing is gone, but it's not so far that I can't go back to it if I don't want to. And after talking to him that day, I said, no, nah, I'm done. If, I, if I'm going to create a new path for myself, yeah. I have to be focused on that and that only. And I'm getting information from the horse's mouth. I'm getting information from these guys. They gave me encouragement and they told me what it takes to survive financially. George with the publishing and Ronald Bell with just the, the focus on one thing, you know, to be great. He, he, he idolized John Coltrane. 
as a saxophonist and he was a songwriter. You know, I, my drummers, Funky George, Bernard Purdy, Clyde Stubblefield, Joe Dukes, Max Roach, Mitch Mitchell, Elvin Jones. That's my goal. And then my band, which is writing, you know, and then from that comes publishing. And then once I did that, it was a struggle for about six to eight months. And then all of a sudden I started getting more work as a drummer, more work. People are like, yo, I could see the improvement. Like I had a lot of things that a lot of drummers didn't have. Like I had an ear, I knew how to kick good sounds. But in terms of making decisions on stage or knowing when to play what, or, you know, technique and different things like that, listening to a lot of music and knowing what to play, just my IQ as a drummer and as a musician, it got stronger because I'm not doing a verse for this guy. For, for a couple hundred bucks. Hey, Jay, you got a beat? Nah, I don't, but let me go back through my old disc from 50 years ago and pull one out that hasn't been used. Yeah, it, it creates a sort, some sort of laziness if you have a library. They, yeah, it, it's yeah. like, and you know, around 2015, 16, I was just like, I re and then, you know, I was part of a group, a super group that went sour, and that was the final straw. We got booed off stage, the record never came out. It was a mess. And I just said, I can't serve two masters. I can't try to master my craft. And then just because I was established in hip hop, it doesn't mean I should go back and pick from it. You know, like that tree has been picked already. It's done. There's no passion. It shows. I don't care. I'm checked out. For me to go back and get a couple of hundred dollars here, 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 not only is it bad for me, but it's bad for the music because it's a disservice to those artists who sought me out and it's a disservice to the craft of being a hip hop producer or artist or whatever. Like let the next generation do that because that they're hungry, let them do it. I'm taking up space. Let me go play my drums and get the fuck out of here and let the ne next. It's the sort of story that you don't hear often. Like a lot of people do stick with whatever they're doing. One thing and, and, and they do it and then 50 years later, they can go back and perform their hits from 30 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Like Big Daddy Kane can always perform Ain't No Half Stepping. Pharrell Mons can always perform Simon Says. Master Ace can always perform Sitting on Chrome. These are guys who've been around for ages. I can't go back and perform my old stuff. My my path is different. Rob Bass can always play It Takes Two. Sir mix a -Lot can always play Baby Got Back. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you can always play Gin and Juice. I have a whole career that I can't go back to. The door is closed. I think that's a decision that you make, though. That's a decision I made. Yeah. Well, yes and no, because, you know, towards the end, I would do shows and three people would be there, you know. But I think nostalgia over time, old becomes new again. I think if I stuck around, there might be a resurgence in the next five years and I could go cash in on it and then come out. But that's weak. Well, it's all about it's all about if you don't like what you're doing, then then, then you got to move on. And it's like exactly. people are going to be disappointed. People ain't going to take you seriously. They're going to want to live in the past. Like the last show I ever did live as a rap artist, I walked off stage in the middle of my set. Did I just quit? I, because the song I had to perform was my most popular song, and I hated the song so much that just. Rapping it made me sick to my stomach and I walked off the stage and I never, that was 15 years ago and that was the end of it, you know, and I only was on stage one time after that. Like I said, I was part of a super group about seven years ago. We did South by Southwest, one show, 15 minute showcase. We got booed off stage. It was different because I didn't want to be there. You know, I was playing drums and rapping and when I was on the drums, I felt good. And when I had to come up and rap, my heart wasn't in that shit. You know what I mean? And it's like, that was all these things happened within a two year period, meeting the cool in the gang guy, being in a in a rap group that fell apart and getting booed off stage. My grandmother died. I went through a bad breakup. Uh, I started the do rights and went off as a drummer. I would do like all these things, good and bad happened in a two year period. And by the time I got to 2018, when I met Ronald Bell, it was like, no, this is the final sign that that you have you're on the right path and you have to go forward and close the door and lock it and never look back and it's just ironic that these are guys i've idolized throughout all my musical phases and in the most recent when i actually met them and they told me they gave me the recipe of what to do so now for me to ignore what they told me would almost be blasphemy 
to, you know, to all the years I studied and, and been a fan. Like I had, and Ronald Bell passed, you know, in 2020 and I was devastated. And it's like, if you don't take what he told you and move forward, then you're doing yourself a major disservice. When it comes to Cool and the Gang, uh, except for maybe the hits or the obvious songs, which would be the song that you first play for somebody, for somebody who doesn't know their music that well? Yeah, I know. It's a, maybe a tough one, but you know, you have one chance to convince somebody to listen to Cool and the Gang. What would be the song that you play? I would probably pick Music as the Message just because it has a little of everything. My personal favorite is Rated X and Give It Up, but Music is the Message like has some vocals. It's got, you know, some chord strong. It's, it's not as jammy as the other one, um, but I would say music is the message because it's got everything I love about them, like the kind of half vocal, half not vocal. And then it's got Funky George takes a drum break in the middle. That's just ridiculous. And that's like the whole DNA for how I play. It's got the trademark horns. Ronald Bell has this great solo. You know, it has harp, which is not in a lot of their stuff. So that makes it different. Like they have actually have a harp player on the song. And um, it's just, it's, you know, I would probably say, you know, this one, um, but yeah, and man. It, as, a whole, as a whole record, is that is that like a, the record as well that you would pick? Yeah, as a whole, I mean, these three behind me are the ones, mm -hmm. depending on what day you ask me, I'll pick a different <laughs> one. But overall, I'll say the music is the message just because that was the one that every day I'd pull out my bass guitar and play to. And when I got my drum set, that's how I learned how to play to that record. You know, playing the wall to it. That those were the first beats that I learned. I want to thank Jay for this conversation. On next week's episode, I'm talking to Atlanta rap legend Cujo from Goody Mob about Crush Groove. Thanks for listening, watching, or however you check out accolades. Give us a thumbs up or follow our channel. See you next week. <laughs>